Hello everyone and welcome to The Wrap, brought to you by Michigan Medicine Headlines. I'm Dan Elman with the Department of Communication. And I'm Dan's co-host for the day, Anuja Mudali. Today, we're going to celebrate an important achievement at Michigan Medicine, a perfect score achieved on the Healthcare Equality Index, powered by the Human Rights Campaign. Now, before we get into that, you can give yourself perfect scores by going back and getting caught up on any episode of The Wrap you may have missed. You can find the shows on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast hosting platform. New episodes can also be found on the Michigan Medicine YouTube channel and as part of the headlines week in review. On that note, let's bring in Pedro Corsitas, who will discuss the recent HEI score and how Michigan Medicine has worked to improve the experience for LGBTQ plus patients and families. Pedro, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, so happy to be back, uh, seeing familiar faces. Hopefully we can do this in person one day again. Huh? I know, it's been a while, huh? It's been a while, yeah. <laughs> All right, so first, one of the ways the organization has really stepped up its efforts when it comes to serving the LGBTQ plus community is through the creation of the Advisory Committee for the Advancement of LGBTQ plus Health. Can you tell us a little bit about that committee and what it does? Yeah, this has been a, a cornerstone of our work and it's really been kind of what's brought everything together. So um, early 2020, we created the Advisory Committee to kind of help develop a shared vision around the work that we wanted to do in LGBTQ health at Michigan Medicine. Um, there's a lot of organic grassroots efforts that a lot of faculty, staff, learners were kind of doing across the health system. Um, but our executive sponsors, uh, Dr. David Brown and Keith Grant, um, kind of came together and said, hey, let's form an advisory committee that really kind of unify and kind of help lead this work in order to make some impactful change within the health system. So the current committee, um, we're, we've been growing over the last few years. We're kind of in the 30, 40 range right now. Um, it's faculty, staff, learners, patients. We all come together. Um, on the faculty, staff, learner side, it's a variety of disciplines, doctors, nurses, um, staff members, you name it. So we just got a variety of different kind of perspectives, opinions, thoughts, all really just coming together to kind of, you know, lead this work and help change um, experience for patients, families, and the LGBT community for the better at Michigan Medicine. So what does achieving a perfect HEI score of 100 mean for our patients and families? So yeah, so the Human Rights Campaign is the organization that puts on the Healthcare Quality Index. So they're one of the leading uh, LGBTQ advocacy groups in the nation. And uh, they developed the Healthcare Quality Index a few years ago. They've been going on for, I think, 15 years now. Um, it's a tool that health systems that participate can use to really assess their ability to provide culturally competent LGBTQ healthcare to patients within the community. And so uh, health systems are evaluated on four big pillars. Um, it's non-discrimination and staff training, patient uh, rights, responsibilities, community engagement. And then they also do some general assessments on employee policy and benefits. And so uh, you get a score out of 100. Each one of those has its own weight. Um, and there's a variety of questions that they kind of just kind of give you to assess. Um, when we first started our journey on this, our lowest score um, was about 55, but generally we sat in the 70 range. So with the support of our executive leadership and then the engagement for our faculty, staff, and learners, you know, we've really been able to get the score up to 100. Um, and so it's a good kind of check-in for us, right, with the work that we're doing. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are perfect, doesn't mean that we don't have more work to do. It really just kind of is a testament to the work that we've been doing um, and those that have been engaged. So. You know, we're confident that we'll keep getting a, a perfect score, a hundred out of a hundred, um, but we're just more excited about what's to come um, and what the advisory committee can do and what we can do to kind of further enhance the experience for patients and families. Yeah, I like that you mentioned, you know, that it's really just sort of a milestone on this journey. Can you outline some of the specific changes that have been made in recent years to improve healthcare for the LGBTQ uh, community? Yeah, so much of the work has been guided um, really by what our patients and families, but also our faculty, staff, and learners have brought forth, um, you know, telling us what it is that they want to see, what it is that we need to improve. So a lot of our work has really just kind of been bringing that voice together, bringing those thoughts together and acting upon them. Um, from the patient side, one of the things that we've heard the most is, hey, I just want to know um, if there's a list of providers that I can kind of go see, um, you know, just providing a little bit more safe care for an environment that they can feel more safe, talking about their sexual orientation, gender identity, um, what the healthcare implications are, things that they should be considering. So we developed that list, um, continue to kind of grow it. 
um, with the help of our awesome communications person, Anuja, we were able to create a LGBTQ health website. It's patient facing. Um, and in that website, we provided a variety of different tools for our patients, um, you know, how to add your sexual orientation, gender identity to your medical record, um, the work that we're doing and more information about the advisory committee. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that we're just kind of um, just on the front end of it. Um, we just started our planning for the advisory committee this year, and just kind of excited and looking at the next things that we can do. A lot of focus in this coming year on community engagement, just broadly outside of the community, outside Michigan Medicine, but then also a lot of work on supporting our faculty, staff, and learners, whether that's developing additional training um, that we can provide out there um, or other things like celebrating Pride Month, which is coming up in two, two months in June. We know that all this work is to support our patients. Um, specifically, like what are some main concerns that LGBTQ patients have when they're looking for a new provider? I think um, it's a shared concern for anybody that has you know, a, a diverse background. And I think it's just wanting to feel safe, um, to kind of bring that anxiety down. I think about myself when it's just like that annual checkup, right? I always get anxious. I know I eat well, I know I exercise, but I'm kind of always worried. I'm like, oh, what if my blood pressure is up? What if my um, you know, blood sugars are off or something? So even just going to the doctor as a somewhat healthy human is anxiety provoking and kind of makes you feel like, whoa, I don't want to go, or maybe I'll just cancel it or pretend I'm sick. Um, and so once you start adding some of those additional identities on there, it just becomes a little bit more potentially overwhelming for some folks, right? Can I talk about the fact that I'm gay? Can I talk about the fact that I may be trans or I'm struggling with some of these things? And is my doctor going to respond in a way that is supportive and engaging and actually kind of helps me take care of myself? So, you know, um, when you put it all together, it can create a uh, anxious kind of feeling that some folks don't want to go through. And so for us, um, that's part of the work that we're trying to do is just alleviate that concern, right? Make patients feel safe, make sure that they can come to us and know that they can come to us, um, that we're providing education our providers, that we're talking about it and we're doing things like being inclusive and in how we ask for sexual orientation and different things. Yeah. Uh, I think let's dive a little bit deeper into that. I know a lot of our faculty and staff here really do want to be inclusive, right? And they want to lessen that anxiety for their patients. So if you are a provider who interacts with patients at Michigan Medicine, or even if you're just, you know, a patient services associate or so many people who interact with our patients and families on a daily basis, how can you make sure you're providing the best patient experience possible? Yeah, I think one thing that we focused on is education. Um, and I think a lot of it is just, you know, helping people kind of figure out where do I start? Sometimes it's just getting you caught up on the terms and teaching you what the words are, what the definitions are. And then, you know, step two is really just how do you apply that to your care of patients, right? What does it look like or where can you store it in a medical record? Uh, what's the conversations that you should be having? How can you make the clinics more inclusive? So, you know, one of the things we developed is we developed the inclusive language training in partnership with uh, the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. Um, it's out there, it teaches you kind of terminology one-on-one -on -one, and it really starts to get your feet wet on like, you know, what's a pronoun? Um, what's a preferred name? All the things that really can go into making your care more inclusive. And then I think from there, it's really just practice. I mean, you know, just, we're always kind of evolving, we're always getting better, we're always learning. Um, so just really having that interest and that ability to kind of go out there and learn and teach and grow so that you can just you know, get better at providing the care that you're providing to our patients in general, but also just specifically with the needs of the LGBT community. Thanks, Pedro. Um, I think we covered the questions that we intended. Is there anything else that you want to add before we move on to the next round? Um, no, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a celebration. I think, like I said, it's, it's been a couple of years in the making. Um, it really just, just to reiterate, it could not have happened without support from leaders, but then also just to generally community being engaged and wanting to make this change. Um, so I think we're just, we're wanting to just build the momentum and build the energy and the excitement. Um, if you want to get participated, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to bring more people on the advisory committee. If you're like, what's this training you talked about? Reach out, we'll help you to, to get connected with the person that can get it scheduled. But you know, we're really just trying to create awareness and try to create engagement and get that energy moving and going. Um, keep building on it just to keep getting better. Great, thank you so much for that information. But don't leave us, you're not done yet. Um, I don't know, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> You've been on the wrap before, but you've never been part of the lightning round. So we, this is the 
uh, for us to ask you some quick fire questions, not related to work, more personal. Sure. Are you ready to go? All right. Uh, I guess as I'm ready as I will be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. If you weren't working at Michigan Medicine, what would you want your career to be? Oh, flight attendant. I always wanted to be an airline flight attendant. It was like uh, my lifelong dream. Um, I did it for a little bit. Probably should have. I, I couldn't have kept doing it. The lifestyle is just too hectic. Um, but I just, I love talking to people. I love serving people. I love just being with people and like making people feel happy and welcomed. And I just, I love planes. I love the airline industry. It's like a thing I geek out, geek out about still. So yeah. definitely. So what was your favorite part of, of being a flight attendant when you were for a short time? The safety demonstration. It's so much fun. <laughs> When I was Could in you college, still do it? Like, did you learn it by heart and you could still, still do, it? do it? I could still recite it. I could still do it. I when I was in college, it was like I was known that I had like for some odd reason memorized the safety demo <laughs> announcement. So I I could probably still do it. I'm not doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get any ideas. <laughs> All right. We won't make you do it right now, but maybe another day. <laughs> It'll so be its own gonna... special edition of the wrap. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we'll do it in the outtakes. For safety months, we'll do that. <laughs> so for those of those who celebrate, uh, we've had Easter, Passover, and Ramadan in the in all in the past few days. What is your favorite holiday throughout the year? Oh man. Um you know, I got to say Christmas. My husband and I uh, start listening to Christmas music like November 1st. Um, so we, we what, is it a, what's the radio station in Detroit? I can't remember off the top of my head, but first day they start playing Christmas music, we're there, like listening. Yeah. Um, and then I think we just we love, it's just time to bring family together. It's time to take off at the end of the year. Um, you know, it's it's the first two months of winter, so you're still kind of excited about it, and you're just kind of like the snow it's is actually nice. The snows. Snows. Yeah, <laughs> unlike when it snows in April and everyone's grumpy. Yeah, <laughs> you're not over winter yet. I don't know. It's just kind of cool. So it's definitely Christmas. I mean, just you know, from a perspective of my husband, I kind of have that shared interest, and so we just lean into it. It's fun. Yeah. So does for you does Christmas music end on December 25th or does it continue? The Christmas tree stays up through the new year, man. It just doesn't come down. It's just that it's a sad day that say the day that we take it down. Um, because it's just like, all right, the season's over. We gotta we gotta move on, be adults, I guess, or something. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, this week we had Earth Day. If you could travel anywhere on Earth and costs weren't a factor, where would you go? Definitely uh South Pacific. Like I wanna go to Australia, I wanna go to New Zealand. Um, I think it's just one of those scenes that you got to just take a month off because it's so far, it takes forever to get there. While you're down there, like, just do it all. So I've always, it's on my bucket list. I want to go there one day. Um, so if you guys can get a, my glasses to give me a raise so I can afford to do it, like, that'd be great. <laughs> Our listeners can start a GoFundMe. <laughs> we'll work on that if you take us with you. So that's you know, and, if you re, and if you recite the safety uh, information, <laughs> right. I will ask the flight attendants to let me do yes. it. I think you know, it's uh, all, all in for it. <laughs> all right. Um, April is also National Poetry Month. Which do you prefer reading poetry, reading books, or listening to music? Um, oh, listening to music. I have it on all day. Um, it's like one of those things sometimes where like I just can't find the right mood though and so like I there's days I wake up and I'm like I don't know what music mood I'm in and I struggle to find it all day but man when I find it it's it's great um I just I like having it on the background every single genre it just kind of depends it kind of makes the day go by a little bit um yeah. listen to it at the gym like all that stuff like it's just I, I love music Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Pedro, for being a good sport today and for sharing important information on the work Michigan Medicine is performing to improve care for the LGBTQ plus community. Now, if you want to learn more about the organization's recent honor, go to mmheadlines.org. That's mmheadlines.org. And while you are there, check out the featured stories for this week. For instance, Michigan Medicine celebrated Volunteer Week. Employees learned how to prepare for the fourth quarter valuation and the newsletter previewed Patient Experience Week coming up next week. Find all that and more at mmheadlines.org. All right, Anuja, I know it was strategic that you mentioned Patient Experience Week. So <laughs> since you work in the Office of Patient Experience, can you give our listeners a quick preview of the week and the types of activities they can expect? 
Of course, yes. Next week is Patient Experience Week, April 25th through the 29th. And this week is intended to celebrate the people who impact the patient experience. And so for us, it's the faculty, staff, and learners. And because regardless of the function or where they work, everybody has an impact on the patient experience. As you can see from my background, it says we are the patient experience and it implies it, it, it's for everybody in the organization. So while we're, many of us are still in hybrid environments and it's, pandemic is still ongoing, uh, most of our events or actually all of our events this year are virtual events. There's a couple of plain language pledges where you learn how to substitute plain language for uh, medical terminology, a learning forum, and a couple of PX 101 classes, which are patient experience training courses. We also have uh, a poster session called Bright Spots for Patient Experience. Teams across the organization share how they are improving patient experience in their respective areas. All this information is linked in the headlines article this week. Visit mmheadlines.org and search for Patient Experience Week to find more. All right, thank you so much, Anuja. It's time for the weekly trivia contest. Last week, we asked listeners, what does the acronym ECMO stand for? The answer is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Congratulations to Rachel Yu, who sent in the correct answer. Now for this week's question, here's Anuja. This week's question is, what year were the first volunteers brought in to help at Michigan Medicine? Once again, what year were the first volunteers brought in to help at Michigan Medicine? You can find the answer in this week's headline story. And once you know it, send it to headlines at med.umich.edu for a chance to win a prize. That's all the time we have for this week. Thank you so much to Pedro for joining us. And thanks, as always, to all of our listeners and viewers for everything you do for patients, families, and each other. We'll see you next week.